where you get to hear from some of the best authors in crime, suspense, and thriller fiction. And I'm your host, Debbie Mack. Before I introduce my guest, this is a reminder to everyone to check the crimecafe.net website, where you can find, if you click on Crime Cafe, all the interviews from all the authors here at Crime Cafe, as well as the Crime Cafe Mystery and Thriller Package. It's a story package made up of stories from all of the authors who are interviewed here. So with that done, let me now introduce our distinguished guest, Jeremy Duns. He is a really great spy thriller author, and I'm really thrilled to have him here on the show today. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's my pleasure. Um, your se series features the aptly named Paul Dark. <laughs> Tell us generally about the Paul Dark trilogy and about Paul Dark as a character. Okay, well, uh, Paul Dark um, is the protagonist of my series. He's a British secret agent. Uh, he works for MI6. Um, as you say, his name uh, is uh, perhaps a little loaded. Um, my idea there was that I'm a big fan of a lot of 60s spy thrillers. Uh, of course, you have Ian Fleming's James Bond, but there's also Matt Helm, uh, Donald Hamilton's character, there's Joe Gore. Uh, they, they tend to have these very monosyllabic names. So I wanted, I wanted a name that felt like it was a 60s spy, so Paul Dark kind of hit that for me. Uh, but the twist in the series is that he's really on the run from the start. Uh, he's suspected of being double agent working for the Soviets and the twist uh, that you find out very early in the, in the series, so I'm not giving away a lot, uh, is that he is a double agent. He, he has been working for the KGB since his 20s. So um, I've written three books uh, that have been published so far um, that are set in 1969, and a fourth book, uh, Spy Out the Land, which uh, takes place in 1975, uh, mainly in Rhodesia, will be coming out uh, in a couple of months in January. What, you, what inspired you to write about this type of character? Well, I guess when I was in my mid to late 20s, I, I rediscovered spy fiction. I had read quite a lot of it when I was younger, but then I did a degree in uh, literature and I started reading things like Samuel Taylor Coleridge instead. Um, but in my 20s, I, I kind of just chanced across a secondhand bookshop and uh, bought a couple of old spy thrillers and I, I really got into them and I really uh, was amazed at how how brilliantly some of these forgotten spy novels were and uh, over time over the next few years I, I read a lot of spy novels and slowly I started thinking well you know this would be this would be quite fun maybe maybe it would be interesting to try to write a spy novel so that's really where it came from. Where does your latest Paul Dark novel take the story arc for for him oh that's a good question um it it takes it in a very different direction i i had already planned the first three books as a trilogy uh they all the first three all take place in a very very short time span in fact the final book in the in the third book in the trilogy i think takes place in in a, a day or something uh so they all take place in a couple of months at the end of 1969 and they're all very much one story arc which is him on the run uh, from MI6 as a suspected double agent and I kind of closed off that arc at the end of at the end of the Moscow option the third book and felt that I had run the course with that a little bit like the Jason Bourne novels where Jason Bourne is an amnesiac it gets a bit boring if you have dozens and dozens of the same thing where he's trying to remember who he is i thought it would be a bit boring if it was if it was still that so i've tried to expand it uh, this is the first spy of the land it's called it's the first of my books which is not in the first person the first three books are from paul dart's perspective so by making it in the third person i'm i'm really you're really sort of seeing what other people think of him and um he has a family it's uh, six years later uh so i have created a uh, quite a big gap between the two stories and it's a story about um, uh, him uh, his, his family is threatened and he he has to do something about it so it's quite different from the from the previous three novels actually 
I was going to say it's quite different to change um, viewpoints like that within a series. Yeah, I mean, it does it does happen. Um, Lee Child has switched back and forth with the Jack Reachers. I felt, um, in fact, the idea came from a TV producer. The the BBC had bought the option uh, on the Paul Dark series, which uh, they they never got round to making, unfortunately. But we had quite a lot of discussions, and they wrote a script. And while they were writing the script, I had a conversation with the with the producer who who said something that I thought was very interesting, which he said, of course, your books are set, set in the first person, which uh, presents us with a challenge because you cannot show that really very easily on TV. And he used the example, in fact, from the Bourne series where you have Jason, you, you alternate between Jason Bourne kind of on the run, and then you have this kind of crow's nest uh, command center in the CIA where they're kind of chasing him, and you kind of alternate between those two things. And it's very, there are huge advantages to writing in the first person, but one disadvantage is you cannot do that. You cannot ever show what the other people are thinking. So I had to constantly try to think in the first three books. Of, I had to constantly have dark thinking. This is probably what they will do next. And it became quite difficult to do that. And so that got me thinking. I thought it would be pretty interesting, actually, to see the people chasing him and to see what they were going through. So um, although it's a Paul Dark novel, um, it really has two protagonists. The main protagonists are Paul Dark. And then there's an MI6 agent, a young MI6 agent called Rachel Gold, who is chasing Paul Dark. So she's really the kind of equal protagonist in the novel. Hmm, that's interesting. I uh, hope so. <laughs> well, it sounds fascinating to me, and I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying your trilogy so far. Um, right. I noticed, I couldn't help but notice that Paul Dark is kind of like an anti-hero spy protagonist, as opposed he to is, James yeah. Bond, <laughs> yeah. who is an obvious hero protagonist. Did you think about that? that you know distinction kind of to set them apart from from other spy protagonists i did yeah i mean i wanted um in fact originally he was much more of an outright villain when i when i first started mm. drafting the first book and i he was he was um I mean, if you think of Patricia Highsmith's character, Tom Ripley, and the talented Mr. Ripley, and the, and the subsequent books, of course, he's a he's basically a murdering sociopath. But uh, I somehow felt that um, Paul Dark is he's a traitor. He's he's betrayed his country. Um, but I wanted readers to go along with him. I wanted readers to kind of be on his side and perhaps not to make his choices that he would not not to to sympathise, but to at least empathise. And I felt that if he was too villainous, um, you would quickly be turned off and not really want to. So what I'm trying to do is make him, um, in some ways, he's, he's, he has some heroic qualities. He has some integrity. He has some things that you admire about him. And hopefully you, you sort of want him to succeed. But on the other hand, every once in a while, you suddenly remember that actually this isn't really someone I should be rooting for. This guy is 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 re really working for the baddies. He's, he's kind of working for an evil regime. In fact, he is. And he's sort of in it for himself. So I wanted to kind of have that ambiguity and make it a little bit uncomfortable for readers to, to switch between those two things. Do you think uh, readers are more ready for that type of protagonist now, say in wake of of books like Dexter, where you have killers yeah. as protagonists, that sort of thing, than they, they would be, say, in the past? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I hope so. It's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, when, I mean, the, the the books have had a had a different uh, reception, I think, between um, the U.S. and the U.K. Um, okay. Yeah, and. Um, also Canada and Canada and the U.S. even so they were they were much better received in Canada than the states on this ground. So that quite a lot of American readers really didn't like that idea that he that he was a traitor. Um, whereas British Canadian readers, Australian readers, didn't seem to have a problem with it and found it more interesting that that he was. But this is going back really to the first for the first book. That was my my um, my impression, and it might be that things have changed. I mean. I don't really think that anyone had a problem with uh, with Patricia Highsmith uh, and and the talent of Mr. Ripley. I think everyone understood it, but perhaps because in some way he does seem like a James Bond type of figure, uh, it is it is a little bit of a, a stretch. 
but yeah, I mean, Dexter, but also even in the spy genre, you have Homeland. There's a very similar in the season, season one of Homeland, um, Damien Lewis's character, Brody. I mean, you're really torn by that character. Um, the Americans, oh, I don't know, I don't know if you've seen the, the, the spy series, The Americans, where you're, you're rooting for, um, I mean, you really are rooting for a, a pair of KGB agents who are, who are undercover as Americans, illegal Americans uh, living in Washington, D.C. in the 80s. There's a series called Deutschland 83, which just came out, which is similar. It's an East Ger young East German guy who's infiltrated into West Germany. So he's, he's on the wrong side, but you're, you're on his side. So I think it, it has changed a little bit, but it depends from reader to reader. Some readers really like that and find it more interesting. And some readers, for some readers, it's a turnoff because they, they want to read about a hero. Well, that's fascinating considering the number of anti-heroes that are popular. I mean, not just in the spy genre, but uh, in say, like a person like in The Sopranos, Tony yeah. Soprano was with the mob. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I mean, this is also something that, that I discussed a lot with the TV people. Um, and it, it, it is, for me, for me, it was always the, the hook of the series that this was the, uh -huh. main, the main thing that was going to be interesting about it. Um, I don't know. It's something. It's something about the spy genre, perhaps. Um, a lot of people do come into expect. I mean, he's very, he's very much modeled. Dark is very much modeled on a James Bond style figure. I mean, he's he's upper middle class British uh, senior agent within MI6. He's a womanizer. He drinks. So I have several things that kind of remind you of James Bond uh, in particular ways. But my idea was always, what if James Bond, the whole time, had been working for the KGB? That was always my, my kind of premise going into this. Um, and for some people, I think perhaps they're hoping that it will be a James Bond thing, and then that's kind of annoying that it isn't. But I don't know. I mean, I, 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 there's been a range of reactions, but I, I certainly think it's um, – I hope it's more interesting than you – know, I, I hope it's not a turn off myself. Well, I found it wonderful and, and interesting. Thank you. <laughs> I, I just like your writing style, and I love spy thrillers. Yeah, me um, too. That's very kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm also a huge fan of Le Carre's. Um, me too, yeah. I, I was going to say that your writing is influenced by both uh, Le Carre and Fleming. Would you Definitely, say yeah. one has more influence than the other on you? I was, I was thinking... In a sense, Le Carre is more cerebral, I guess, or realistic. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of um, style, uh, I'm probably more influenced by Le Carre. But, I mean, that sounds a little bit strange to say that because he's such an amazing stylist. But um, when when I was pitching the, this, the trilogy with my agent back in 2008, uh, we had a, a line that we, we were using with publishers, which was um, a James Bond-style adventure in a John le Carre world. So that was the kind of um, idea, was to mingle these two influences, was to have the background. The background is, is quite realistic. I mean, all of the, all of the books are set in uh, real events. So I haven't, um, I haven't invented countries or wars or anything. So the first, the first novel, Free Agent, is set in the Biafran War in, in 1969, and I haven't made it into a different country or, or fictionalized the war, which you would often have in a spy thriller. I've used the real events of that war. So that kind of provides some sort of uh, hard, concrete background, I guess. But then on top of this, you have a kind of exciting action thriller so i mean i try to um I, I like both sides of the, the those are those are really the two opposing poles of the spy genre uh ian fleming and john le Carre. and i've tried to i've tried to and i love both of those so i've tried to use both yes um another thing about your your books they're set in the 60s which yeah. to me i mean that's a draw for me another draw um mm. I think with uh, shows like Mad Men, um, yeah, it kind of demonstrates that people are interested in that period anyway. So uh, that's another good thing about your books. I think it would appeal to people who are interested in that period of time, the Cold War era. Well, I hope so, yeah. Um, as I said before, the, the first three are set in 1969 within a couple of months. So it's, um, it's quite a specific period of the 60s, right at the end of the 60s. And then this new one, I go into the 70s, which has a different feel because 
Um, the first three are really spy thrillers, and mm -hmm. Spy Out, Spy Out the Land, despite the title, uh, is a little bit more of a political thriller because it's about terrorism. Because of course, the 70s, the Cold War kind of shifted. So during the during the the 60s, particularly in in the UK, double agents like Paul Dark were a national obsession, but and, and an obsession of the intelligence agencies because you had Kim Philby, uh, George Blake, and the rest of the Cambridge spies. You had these real double agents. That were kind of tying him up in knots. So uh, in the first three novels, he's really a, a Philby figure. He's really in that in that thing. And then in the 70s, you really had oil, terrorism, um, and, and it kind of moved into a slightly different thing. So each point in the Cold War, you had uh, different um, elements came out at, came out to the fore. And I, one of the things that I found a lot of fun about writing them so far is the research because of course it's enormous, enormously interesting to go back and 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 uh, read books and watch documentaries and and find declassified information about these these areas. I was going to say you must do a substantial amount of research. I do, yes. Mm. Um, I did. I mean, for Free Agent, I I researched the novel for a full year before I started writing it, um, because um i planned to write more than one book and i i realized that i would need to know a lot about the 60s if i was going to do that and really i wanted to immerse myself to the extent where it wasn't just that i knew about biafra which i was writing about or the exact things in the plot of that book but that i knew about other things that were going on around it um i, I was born in 1973 so uh, creating a, a realistic or authentic seeming world from before i was born um, meant that I had to do a lot of research um, at points, uh, perhaps a little bit too much research. I was tracking down menus from restaurants in Nigeria and doing all sorts of uh, things that I probably didn't need to do. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm fascinated by research and what I particularly like doing is finding information that has come out fairly recently that wasn't known at the time and then feeding that back into the books. Yes, yes, that's interesting. Um... And you've also written some nonfiction books related to the intelligence community. Can you talk about those? Yeah, well, I've, I've written one, one uh, nonfiction, uh, full length nonfiction book um, about espionage, which is called Dead Drop uh, in the UK, and it's titled Codename Hero uh, in the States. And that is about um, a real life MI6, uh, joint MI6 CIA operation that took place. Uh, in the early 60s during the Cuban Missile Crisis um, in which a Soviet colonel called Oleg Penkovsky um, approached initially the CIA and then, the M and then MI6 uh, in Moscow and volunteered to spy for us. And it's a classic operation, it's a very well-known operation, there have been many books about it, famously uh, during the Cold War, um, the Penkovsky papers, which were purportedly his diaries, smuggled out of uh, Moscow before his execution, um, but in fact uh, were largely written by the CIA. Um, and I've, I became fascinated by it when I was, I knew about the operation previously, but when I was researching the Moscow option, which is uh, quite a lot of it is set in Moscow, unsurprisingly, um, I was trying to figure out quite uh, specific things about how MI6 operated in Moscow during the 60s and I found there was really almost nothing declassified and most of it was was in this operation so I then went back and read a lot of stuff about the Penkovsky operation and then when I was reading about that operation I realized that there were quite a few very strange things about it uh, things that we didn't know about it um, mainly that we we did we still do not know how the KGB figured out that he was a traitor and so the more I looked into it, the, the more strange things I found. And eventually I thought this, this is something that I need to go into detail about. So it's a reinvestigation of that operation. It's a look at how the Cuban Missile Crisis unfolded through the espionage community, in fact. Hmm. Did uh, the idea for this book come out of the research you were doing for, non for your fiction? Yeah, it came it came directly out of researching uh, the Moscow option, uh -huh. and I, I realized that, um, that we had a kind of closed book on uh, what British and to a, to an extent American intelligence were doing in Moscow during the Cold War. There's not that much 
around people think there is is a lot but there isn't that much around so while i was researching it i kept coming back to this operation because it's really the biggest declassified chunk of material that we have about how uh, mi6 and the cia operated during the cold war in the soviet union so i was reading more and more about it and the more i read about it the more i realized this was something that i wanted to investigate further well that is just fascinating and uh like i said i think spy novels are just but some of the most interesting writing out there. Um, now you've got me wanting to read more uh, Fleming <laughs> because well, I've never should. actually it's, read the books. <laughs> oh really? Okay. Well, I mean, it, it, it's very weird. It's, it's a weird read. They're very they're very uh -huh. dated in some ways. But oh, yeah. I would certainly recommend um, if you do read them. I would certainly recommend Casino Royale, the first novel, which is talking about anti-heroes i mean james bond is really an anti-hero in that book it's a very dark surprisingly bleak book he's not really very uh, likable he's not the suave guy from the films he's not sean connery he's certainly not roger moore uh, he, sm <laughs> he smokes 70 he smokes 70 cigarettes on the first page if i remember correctly so it's a real i mean talk about mad men i mean it's a real uh it's it's a it's a dark read sounds fascinating um, if they ever do make your books into a series or a movie, who can you yeah. imagine playing Paul Dark? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I don't know. Um, people have occasionally asked me that. I don't know. I, I try not to picture anyone uh, when, I'm, when I'm writing them. I think that would be too, uh, too off-putting. Um, so I don't, I, don't have, I don't have anyone. I don't think of anyone. I, I can't. I can't really think. I mean, there are, there are a number of actors who could do it. I think I did have a discussion when the the TV series was was in discussion um, that one way that would be effective is to have someone who traditionally plays quite heroic roles, um, because there's a the twist that he's a double agent mm -hmm. happens happens quite early on, um, but in the in the very first scene of the first novel, you don't know he's a double agent. Um, and in fact, you kind of think he's going to be a sort of James Bond kind of guy. So if you have someone who looks like he's going to be a James Bond kind of guy, the moment when you realize is quite a significant moment at the end of the first chapter of Free Agent, which sort of sets up the whole trilogy, really. Um, the moment that you realize that he's not a kind of good guy, James Bond type person is much more shocking than if you were to cast someone who kind of looks a bit bad. You know, so if you so my only thing would be someone who kind of looks heroic in some way, you know, or that he could conceivably be the good guy, I think would be more effective. But I don't have anyone in mind. Having someone who normally plays a, a real good guy hero would be yeah. a real twist for the audience. I think. Yeah. And I'm sure the actor would probably want to sink their teeth into it. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So, I mean, someone, in fact, I just, just now have just been watching a, a film um, I don't know if you've heard of the the, the um, thriller Before I Go to Sleep. I've heard of it. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a surprisingly dark performance in that from uh, the British actor Colin Firth, who you don't associate with mm. that kind of uh, role. You would normally think of him as um, a, as being well, a sort of nice nicer guy. Uh, and he's 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 uh, well. I don't want to ruin the film, but he's there's some surprising angles to his character in it that you don't see uh, normally from his roles. Um, so someone like that, for example, if you had him, you wouldn't expect a guy like Colin Firth to be playing uh, a double agent. I don't think exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, do you have anything to add before we uh, finish up? Um, I don't think so. But uh, it was lovely of you to invite me on. Well, it's my pleasure, Jeremy. And believe me, if they ever make the, the TV TV series or movie out of your books, I'm going to put it, if the BBC ever decides to do anything with your <laughs> books, it's going to be right up there with Doctor Who on my must-watch list. <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately, they, they renewed the option a few times, but unfortunately, it doesn't look like that's going to be that's going to happen. So they're still available. If there's any if there's any budding uh, film producers in your audience who want to buy the rights, they're welcome to get in touch with me or my agent. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. It was great having you on. And again, I'd like to remind everybody that um, the crimecafe.net website has a link that you can click, Crimes Cafe. 
to get to the page where you can buy the 99 cent story package with stories contributed by all the authors who are interviewed here on Crime Cafe. So thank you again, Jeremy, for being here. It was wonderful. And um, I'll see the rest of you in two weeks. Thank you.